So if anyone knows me, knows my channel, or is familiar with uh, Board Game Breakfast uh, on uh, the Dice Tower channel, you know that I am really big into Kickstarter. Enough that I do a weekly segment about it, and I've backed a lot of different Kickstarter games, much to the chagrin of my bank account and probably my future well-being. But nevertheless, it's there. I do love Kickstarter, and I will say that this game that we're about to talk about, Guilds of Cadwallon, has a special place in my heart because it was the very first not just board game, but project that I backed on Kickstarter. I was turned on to Kickstarter by a friend who had backed a, uh, an album, what's her name? Uh, I don't know, the woman who's dating Neil Gaiman, uh, and uh, a musical album. And I was like, oh, I'll check it out. And it turned out to be really interesting. I was just getting into board games really hardcore at the time, and I loved what I was seeing. I loved the excitement of these projects and seeing the numbers go up and going through all of these different stretch goals. And Guilds of Cadwall, and I came in at the 11th hour. I think it was only two days before the project was set to end. And it being a cool mini or not project, after the advent of Zombie Side, it was already a sure bet. It had way, way sailed past all of its funding goals, went through all the different stretch goals, and I was really inclined to try it out because it was cheap. It was only like 25 bucks for the set. I actually pledged an additional $10 for this big box and a board, game board that comes with it. So if you see this on the shelf at your FLGS, your friendly local game store, or even if you buy it from an online retailer at this point, it's going to be in a much smaller box without the game board in it. But nevertheless, the game is essentially the same. Uh, and what is the game? Well, it takes place in the Cadwallon universe. Um, I don't know. I, I think it's called the Confrontation universe. There's been other board games based on this. City of Thieves, which is on my shelf. I haven't played it yet. Um, Arcana, also haven't played it yet. And also, there was a miniatures game called uh, Confrontation Age of Ragnarok. It was a combination of two different games. Uh, all of them are in the same universe. This specifically is about a city called Cadwallon, and uh, each player takes control of like a guild, a different type of guild, like a necromancer's guild, a, a thieves' guild, a soldiers' guild, all these different types of things, and you're vying for control of the streets of Cadwallon. Uh, it's uh, very, hmm, I don't know. Let me just go ahead and show you. It's kind of hard to describe, but let me show you an overview of the game. And then we're going to come back. I have a lot of different thoughts about this game. This review has been long overdue. Uh, we'll come back, and I'll tell you my final thoughts. Guilds of Cadwallon is a competitive game taking place in the of uh, confrontation Cadwallon universe uh, and it's for normally two to four players now I should mention that in this overview I'm going to depict be depicting some of the extra Kickstarter bits that you may not have access to in the normal base game. And for instance, this board is an optional add-on. I'm not even sure that you can actually purchase this after the fact. It was only might have only been part of the Kickstarter. I think some of the different faction bits were only part of this Kickstarter as well, as well as some extra cards. But I'm just going to go over the base game and maybe talk about some of those little extra bits. With some of those, you can and the game board, you can actually go up to a six-player game. But I'll just do this presuming that it's a four player game. Now the goal here is to try to take control of the different streets of the city of Cadwallon. You're going to be doing this by putting out uh, different uh, agents from your faction and putting them between the different streets. Now all the agents kind of have different names like the necromancers and the, the thieves but none of it really matters that much but you're really doing is just taking your different colored pawns and putting them out on the board. So some of these cards, each different at the beginning of the game, you'll shuffle up the deck of the location cards and put the, make a three by three grid. Again, if you're playing with more players, it would make a bigger grid, uh, just depending on how you want to do it. And then you'll start the game. Now, each of these it has a different sort of ability. Most of these are guild cards. So, for instance, the Guild of Usurers, which uh, the different parts of the card. Up here in the top is just the symbol denoting what faction it's part of, and this is very important during endgame scoring. Then you have the name. Then the gold coins here indicate what, uh, how many po guild points this card is actually worth. Again, that's important during endgame scoring. Uh, and then down here at the bottom is the support value. And this is the support that this section of the city is going to be giving to you when you're vying for control, but we'll get back to that in a moment. Um, uh, another example, here's the Guild of Goldsmiths. It's actually worth three guild points, but only offers a support of one. Um, militia cards. Militia cards are nasty because these are actually going to be negative points at the end of the game if you're unfortunate enough to take them. So you don't want to take militia cards if you can avoid it. Uh, here's the Guild of Blades, two guild points, two support. And then there are character cards. And character cards count as sort of wilds. When you're doing endgame scoring, you can have them count as another type of faction card so long as you don't already have 
three cards in a faction because the, uh, more than three cards in a faction because the maximum is four. Because what you're basically trying to do is not just take a bunch of random faction cards, you're ideally going to try to take as many of the same ones as you can because it's the points are multiplied, but we'll cover that in a moment. As far as the actual turn to turn gameplay, you'll decide who's going first and here's your first player card. And that's going to pass around as the game progresses uh, in each round the first player card will pass clockwise. But at the beginning of the game, on each subsequent round, you're gonna draw cards from the deck to fill up however many spaces you're using for the grid. Because it's possible that some certain city streets will stay out there, in which case you just fill up. The game ends when you can no longer fill up every section of the street with any cards. If that happens, the game is just over if you don't have enough cards to fill it out. So, in turn order, each player is going to go through uh, two, di they're going to take two different actions on their turn, or the option of two different actions. So, first, they must put out one of their agents between one of the city streets. You can't go along the edge of the board, it has to be between one of these different alleyways here. All right? And then after that, they have the option of playing an action card, which is one of the other types of cards that you might find in this deck and which you can buy for control of. So for instance, the new markets card, exchange two cards that show the same district style, or um, enforcers, lay down one of your agents already played in a boulevard, the agent's support is doubled this round. These are cards that you may actually be out on the board and you can buy for control of them just like the others. In fact, you see that they offer support and they're worth guild points, but you have to acquire them first on a previous round, so in the first round that's really not going to happen, and then use them as an optional rule after you put down one of your agents. So each player is going to keep doing that, putting down agents, possibly playing action cards, uh, until everyone runs out of agents to play, depending on the number of streets that are out in the game. Essentially you have to fill up every section of the game board, all the different streets and alleyways, at which point you try to determine what the control is. Now I mentioned that each of these cards has a support value. When you put an agent down, you're trying to vie for a control of a particular section of the city street. Let's just say, I'm just putting a bunch of random guys out here just as an example. All right, it's good enough for now. Uh, so basically, when you're trying to gain control of a card, you're going to put one of your agents next to it and hope that you're lending enough support to that card to take it over. The support that you lend to a card that you're trying to take is equal to the support of the card that's on your other side. It's kind of hard to explain, but for example, if the uh, brown or reddish, I tried to go for a Ninja Turtles theme here, uh, but if the brown or reddish uh, player is trying to take control of this uh, Guild of Goldsmiths card, then he put his agent here and he's giving one support towards taking over this card. However, the orange player is not get, having any support taken from this character card because character cards give no support, so nothing is going there. But he, the orange player is getting two support from this card towards taking this card over. So during the control phase, uh, orange would actually win this card. Hence, orange is going to take one of these chips and put it on the card until the control phase is over. But now over here, orange is vying for control of this corner card. But he's only getting one support from this card, orthog you're always doing this orthogonally. Therefore, he does not beat Blue, who is giving three support towards taking over this district. Blue gets it, puts a control chip there. And that's basically it. You're going to keep going around and doing this, trying to vie for control of these different spots by taking support from the opposite card. So it's very, you have to very carefully put your guys out there to try and get to be as most efficient about it as you can, trying to take over as much territory as possible. Once everyone's got a different chip on a card, and I'm just randomly placing them at this point, um, and it's possible, again, that uh, more than one, if more than one player ties for a card, then that card does not get taken control of by anyone, and it stays out there when the cards are replenished. But for the cards that are taken control of, you'll remove your control chips and actually take them and put them into your stack. Now, if they're guild cards, or if they're character cards, you'll just put them in front of you and try to make your different sets. Um, if they're action cards, you'll take them and keep them secret and use them on a future round as described before. And that's basically the game. You're gonna keep going, doing that until you no longer have enough cards to replenish the city. Then you're gonna go through all of your different points. Now you get points for a few different things. First off, for your guild cards, uh, again, you're trying to make sets. And what I mean by that is you're going to take um, all the cards you have a particular set up to four. You get two. You add up all the guild points, which are the coins at the top. So this one has two. And then you're going to take all the total amount of guild points you have for just that faction, in this case the Guild of Blades, multiply that number 
by the number of guild cards you have. So for a number up from one to four, multiply that by the number of guild points you have, the coins, that's how many points you get for that faction. Do the same for all the other faction cards that you have and add all those points together. Uh, now the wild cards, the character cards, can, like I said before, can count as a card in one of those different factions so long as you have less than four, in which case you can increase your multiplier essentially because you see they're not worth any points on their own. Uh, now the militia cards, those are the nasty ones. If you were forced to take militia cards, they basically count as negative points, which is what this little black sphere indicates up here. But much like with the guild cards, they multiply. So if you took more than one militia, you're gonna add up all those little negative point markers, multiply them by the number of militia that you have, you take that many negative points. And then you add up all the total points you have, negative and positive, whoever has the highest score, is the winner. That's essentially Guilds of Cadwall. Now there's a couple of optional things I should mention. Uh, first of all, like I said, uh, if you have the components for a bigger game, you'll have these little cards here, but we'll tell you how to do that, playing on a bigger grid with more units. Uh, if you're playing in a big enough game uh, with a big enough city, you may have to take control of uh, if you're playing with a bigger grid but not a lot of players, you may take control of more than one actual faction color. Uh, you have these condition cards which will modify the gameplay. So for instance, political unrest, all personality cards have a support value of one for the entire game. Broken alliances, at the end of the game, each player can only have score points for two, guild total, two guilds total. Any other guild cards are worth zero guild points. So you'll choose one of these and it basically influences the entire game. You also have the contract cards, which are like secret objectives that you each player gets one at the beginning randomly. You keep it hidden. If you're actually able to complete it, you get bonus points. So score guild points equal to the number of personalities you have. Personalities, I'm sorry, are the wild character cards. That's what their proper name is. Um, for each use of four unique, for each set of four unique districts, score four guild points. Each card can only be counted once. Uh, that's the same one. For each set of three different support values. Score three guild points. Each card can only be counted once and cards without support values are not counted. So a lot of other different ones. Those are just variants you can add to the game. That's Guilds of Cadwallon. Now when you look at the artwork and you look at what the theme of the game is supposed to be and you see all the little cool miniatures that come with this game, you can be sort of led into believing that this is a very uh, thematic game, sort of almost even an Ameritrash game. But the fact of the matter is this is a very abstract game. What you're doing basically is just uh, deterministically putting out pieces, take, trying to take control of different areas. And I actually had the feeling as I was playing this that it was somewhat similar to either chess or go, like a multiplayer version of that. Because when it gets to your turn, it is there is always an optimal move. There is no different routes to victory in this game. There's an optimal move, a suboptimal move, or a move that's gonna get you nothing, uh, is what this game comes down to. When it gets to someone's turn, what and one of the big faults of this game is that essentially they're just going to stare at the board for some time until it clicks in their head what they're supposed to do until they look at the different options that they have and realize this is what i have to do if i want to have any chance of doing anything on this turn there is some sort of forward thinking i mean you're setting things up by putting a guy here and hoping that you know your opponent doesn't put a guy on this side of the card and fight you for it but that's the problem too is that with more especially with more players in the game it's a very unlikely that you're going to be able to get what you need. And what you're hoping for is that your opponent screws up. And that's why I think it feels like chess or go in a way. I mean, there's not a, there, there is some luck in this game because you, the allotment of cards that make the city is always changing and you have different ones that come out. You can't really hope, you just, you just have to hope that you're going to get the cards that you need, but that doesn't always happen. So there's some luck in that regard. But other than that, it's just a matter of getting the cards that you need, trying to not take the militia cards that you don't need, and just hoping for the best. You really just have to hope that your opponent doesn't outthink you. Some people like that. I am not a tremendous fan of that. I think it's one of the big issues that I have with this game. In a very strange way, I compare this to Ricochet Robots. If you're not familiar with that game, it is sometimes called the game of staring because people just stare at the board until the solution comes to them. That's what happens with this game. And that's an issue because that means that AP, Analysis Paralysis, is a huge problem here especially when you're playing with more players. And that's where I want to talk about the Kickstarter exclusive stuff. The Kickstarter exclusive, well, I don't know if it's exclusive. You might be able to get this stuff now, but uh, an extra game board and extra bits that allow, and extra city cards that allow you to play with up to six players. Do not ever do that. 
I don't even know that you should play with four, which is the max of the base game. The more players you add into this, the time t it takes to play increases exponentially. And the time between turns is agonizing, especially when you're seeing people take the stuff that you desperately need in order to meet your objectives or meet your sets of collected cards, and you have no recourse. You can only sit there and hope that they don't do that, that they make a suboptimal move so you can make the move you need to do. Now you have some special ability cards, the city cards that you can take that give you special powers that you can use that can sort of screw things up, but there's no guarantee that you're gonna get the card that you need to actually make a difference. Sometimes switching to city streets or just switching the location of two different units is not gonna make a big deal for you. Um, you just don't know that. So it's kind of just a weird game. It's a weird game that feels like it should be more complex than it is, but it's really not. Now, of course, if there are some extra cards that come with the game, there are uh, little like goal cards, which are extra things that you can work towards that give you extra points. There are the uh, limitation cards that affect the gameplay and put restrictions on the people, but these just kind of feel tacked on. They don't really change the fundamental gameplay that much, and therefore it's not gonna really influence your decision. At least it didn't influence mine. I don't think this is a bad game. I just think it's not nearly as interesting as it wants to be. And maybe it's not the point. I mean, it's a, I mean, if you just get the normal version, it's a rather cheap game. It's supposed to be a rather light sort of game. But the problem is the time. If it's trying to be a light game, it should be much faster than it is, and it's just not. It kind of feels like uh, an exercise in patience every time that I've played it. I've probably kept it this long because, like I said, I have a, it has a special place in my heart as the first Kickstarter game I ever backed. The production value is very, very good. I love all the little miniatures. Uh, but then again, that's part of the problem too, is because you have these very cool miniatures for the different factions, but you never feel any different than the other players. Because what the special powers that you have are only dictated by the cards you're able to take during the course of the game and it's that's just not enough for me it just doesn't feel very thematic it's a very abstract game i th felt like with this world with this universe with these different characters in the game and this awesome looking artwork and the very high quality components they could have just done something really really cool and thematic with the game and i just feel like they didn't i should also point out that there's a couple of uh big mistakes in the rule book if I remember correctly it has been a little while but uh, you should definitely go online and check that out if you do purchase this game or try it um, so I don't know that I could recommend this game if you're really into a lot of different abstract games if that's your bag if that's if you like exploring different kinds of takes on that genre it's definitely worth a try um, if you really love the other Cadwallon games this is really even having not played a couple of them this is really different. So even then, I don't know that I can recommend it, but it does look pretty, it is high quality, but it's definitely a try before you ever consider purchasing it. My name is Nick, this has been Board Game Brawl, and I'm reminding you to get out there and game every day in every way. Take care.